Elsa Gate. The term used to identify a strange video trend that emerged in 2016. Video after video was posted to YouTube under the guise of children's content, featuring characters like Spider-Man of Marvel Comics and Movies fame or Elsa from Disney's Frozen. Featuring these and many more fictional characters, the videos on the surface appealed to children and upon first glance would not be anything concerning. However, many of them included adult themes that were hardly appropriate for the young viewers watching them. After coverage from commentary channels and the media alike, like, YouTube enforced new guidelines to clamp down on the content, putting a stop to it for the time being. But many have noticed a resurgence in the content today, with many of the same tactics being employed by its creators. So what really is ElsaGate? Why does this content exist? Who is behind it? And can anything reasonably be done to stop it? Today, I'll try to provide the answers. If you were on YouTube back in 2016, you probably remember how commentary channels eagerly searched for any bit of internet cringe to milk for content. That spring, they stumbled upon a new target, kids content. However, these weren't your typical children's videos. These were incredibly peculiar and unlike anything anyone had seen before. In the early days of YouTube, many videos unintentionally attracted a younger audience, even if they weren't specifically meant for children. Sketch comedy, animations, and let's plays were all extremely popular. However, these types of videos would naturally emerge as a hobby for their creators, and unexpectedly gain popularity, rather than being cynical attempts to garner and profit off of a young fan base. But now it was 2016, the year of our lord, and YouTube had changed since the late 2000s and early 2010s. It had evolved into a massive business, rather than just some website to kill time on, and people recognized the potential to make money from it. One of the most lucrative new markets was YouTube Kids, which was launched just a year prior in 2015. It was a particularly tantalizing opportunity, because there were very few established children channels on the platform. At the inception of YouTube Kids, Ryan's toy reviews hadn't even come into existence yet. Aspiring content creators realized that by tailoring their content specifically to children, rather than inadvertently appealing to them, they could tap into this market. Kids, especially toddlers, will watch almost anything as long as it's colorful and loud, and they'll often watch their favorite videos repeatedly. Advertisers also valued this niche. The content was clean, at least it was supposed to be, so no major brands would refuse to advertise on it. In fact, they would pay more to do so, because because they knew that kids would easily fall to their marketing tactics. If the prospective creators could market their videos as having educational value, they could gain the approval of parents as well, who might otherwise limit their children's screen time and therefore their time watching videos. Those who saw this opportunity were primarily living in second and third world countries looking to make a quick buck, although this fact would only become known later on. But with that fact in mind, it makes sense that, without an initial budget to hire talented voice actors and create compelling character art, they needed a cheap way to break into the market. Not only that, they needed a way to compete with major corporations like Disney and establish programs such as PBS, who already had intellectual property that children were familiar with. So, what better way to stand a chance than to essentially steal existing popular characters' identities and pretend to be them? A whole genre of cheap-looking live-action videos and animated content cropped up of superheroes and princesses acting out whatever plot lines the creators saw fit. These brand new channels would use these characters in their video titles and thumbnails with plenty of bright colors to at least come closer to the appeal of official programs. However, that's where the similarities between the content that started dominating YouTube Kids in 2016 and traditional television programming ended. Look at the fucking views, people. Here's one from one month ago. 117 million views. Dude, what the fuck? You had these sped up and bizarre videos of adults just acting out random and nonsensical scenarios with no dialogue and royalty free music, but garnering an incredible amount of views in the process, such as on the channel Webs and Tiaras. There were clones following in their footsteps too, like Toy Monster, The Superhero's Life, and The Kids Club. This trend was getting enough views that not only did it attract the attention of regular YouTube, it was covered in The Guardian in June 2016. The latest YouTube craze is a channel where adults don Spider Man and Elsa from frozen outfits and ride giant ducks, grow Pinocchio noses, and lick enormous lollies. Webs and Tiara's first video was only published in March 2016, but the channel has already notched up 1.7 billion views. In May, it was the third most viewed YouTube channel in the world. Based on stats from analytics company OpenSlate, indicating Webs and Tiara's was watched 544.7 million times that month. 
However, if we look beyond the suspicious growth and the slightly unsettling nature of these videos to adult viewers, there wasn't much to criticize about them. They were mindless and strange, but hey, that's what kids' content often is, isn't it? The most significant accusation you could levy against these creators was that they might have been viewbotting, considering how low the number of comments and likes were on these videos compared to the views. However, you could chalk that up to toddlers obviously not knowing how to like or comment and only knowing how to loop videos repeatedly. You could also point out that these videos' primary motivation motivation was making quick cash. For example, among the many Webs and Tiaras clones, H3H3 Productions discovered Ethan and Mo Bradbury were one of them, former pranksters who had shifted from their failing channel to join this new trend. But that was where the discussion seemingly ended. However, in a matter of just half a year, the relatively harmless nature of this strange genre changed. Checking back into YouTube Kids in the fall of 2016 and winter of 2017, the content, for whatever reason, had gotten exponentially worse. It was no longer just poor quality, it was outright inappropriate. How this change happened, and at what exact moment is anyone's guess, but it certainly started turning more heads within the community. Now, I was surprised to find that there wasn't just one channel like this, there's actually quite a few. One of them's called Kids Toon TV, and this channel has such videos as Mickey Mouse Baby Dead in Gas Explosion. And then we got a couple of other pregnant suicide ones. Why is that a thing? When you watch a scene like this one here, you just can appreciate how actually bizarre it is, as we see Hulk declothing, derobing little tip grabbing there, night, a lot of feeling happening there. Like here, they're playing with each other's nipples, now he's getting naked. Guys, how is this not gay? However, this disturbing content proved to be incredibly lucrative. The Bradberries, whose channel was previously struggling to crack a thousand views on each video, experienced a sudden surge in success. Teaming up with Kobe Person, another former prankster, they were racking up tens of millions of views each month and proudly displaying their brand new Bentleys in their videos. That's gotta be the strangest flex ever, showing off the luxury car you bought off traumatizing the next generation. It wasn't just limited to a couple of channels pushing the boundaries of what was acceptable though, within a remarkably short span of time an alarming number of content farms emerged, solely dedicated to churning out the most abhorrent and repulsive material imaginable. This Elsa and Spider-Man industrial complex made it so that, once you clicked on one of these videos, your entire recommended sidebar would be inundated with them, further amplifying the spread of this plague. Frozen Elsa and Joker in the bathroom, Elsa needs to pee, pregnant Spider-Girl toilet prank, and one where the title is in Arabic, but Spider-Man has Elsa tied up in the trunk of a car. There were even versions of these videos where they acted out some of the scenarios with real children. In this video, a little girl is kidnapped while she sleeps by a so-called cave monster that is clearly just a man in a mask. One channel called Anna Kids TV even reportedly did an actual injection of an antibiotic on a child in the same vein as the other injection videos, just real instead, with a little girl in question screaming and crying, which I obviously will not show. For better or for worse, anything is possible with art, so the animation channels were particularly insane. Elsa and Spider-Man eating feces from the toilet, one baby drinking another's urine, Spider-Man and a dominatrix, Mickey Mouse kidnapping Minnie, and who could forget Elsa? Elsa's forced slavery, where she's simultaneously crying and pole dancing. There were these recurring themes that essentially consisted of every fetish or age inappropriate thing conceivable. Pregnancy, going to the bathroom, consuming feces and urine, violence and gore, torture, kidnapping, strip clubs, hypnosis, sleep inflation, vomiting, cannibalism, ball busting, bondage. The list goes on. I mean, I feel like I'm reading that Soy Jack Party copy pasta. <laughs> These themes were just spammed at random with no rhyme or reason, and it was all right there on YouTube Kids, readily accessible to toddlers. One less dark and more hilarious footnote was the Finger Family channel, which pumped out hours of repetitive nursery rhyme animations, sung horribly in what sounds like an Indian accent, featuring any and all characters from every franchise under the sun. They even included, um, famous historical figures, shall we say, for extra educational value. You know, like, like this guy. I don't know whether this is, uh, very historically accurate, though. Hey, maybe this guy knows something we don't. Who am I to say? I mean, if the man with the mustache had that cake, uh, you know, who am I to argue? All this was enough to garner a bit more mainstream attention, other than PewDiePie reacting to the Finger Family videos. Learning Colors with f I didn't read the title. Learning Colors with Farting PewDiePie what? You wish you could dance like that. You wish you had those moves. Like that. Oh, God! Green, toxic, 
poop farts. You had the story being covered in The Verge and BBC. A pregnant Princess Elsa staggers up the stairs clutching her stomach. Disney's popular heroine pauses and with a loud fart poops out a stream of colored plastic balls that bounce down the stairwell. The video, posted to YouTube, has collected millions of views. And another video on the same channel, Joker gets into a serious makeout session with Rapunzel, which is odd, but less bizarre than the clip where Spider-Man impregnates the evil Queen Maleficent. The fourth most popular channel in the US in recent weeks, with over 100 million views, is dedicated to these homemade superhero soap operas. If you're not paying much attention, it might look like an ordinary video featuring Peppa Pig, the cheeky star of her own animated series. But soon after pressing play on this particular YouTube clip, the plot turns dark. A dentist with a huge syringe appears, Peppa's teeth get pulled out. Distressed crying can be heard on the soundtrack. Parent and journalist Laura June almost immediately noticed something was not quite right as her three-year-old daughter was watching it. Peppa does a lot of screaming and crying and the dentist is just a bit sadistic and it's just way, way off of what a three-year-old should watch. The content was bad enough at this point to where parents in Vietnam were complaining about one of the channels there, to which the channel responded by blocking Vietnamese viewers. However, its owner was later fined by Vietnamese authorities for the suggestive content. The Chinese government would also have to deal with the problem of these videos invading their country's media platforms and dispatch substantial resources to crack down on the Spider-Man and Elsa genre. All of this chaos and depravity ramped up going into the spring and summer of 2017, warranting a proper investigation and movement dedicated to getting to the bottom of it. The first attempt to coordinate and gather info took place on 4chan on the Paranormal Board, which is where the first instance of the term Elsagate appears on the internet, on May 31st, 2017. This whole thing needs a name we can use to refer back to, to help in searches and as a point of reference. Maybe Elsagate or something. As anonymous users collected data and put together infographs, the investigation was spread to Twitter, where the Elsagate hashtag gained traction, and in June, the Elsagate subreddit was conceived, quickly garnering tens of thousands of members. The first bit of headway in the investigation was made by understanding that the videos were mostly foreign in origin. Russia, Vietnam, and India were all major exporters of this content, from the animations to the live action stuff. Another example emerged of pranksters going to the dark side of YouTube content creation. I mean, if pranks and social experiments aren't already dark enough. With the Viral Brothers, pranksters from the Czech Republic, one of which, Eric Meldick, started making children's content with his girlfriend on a channel called Superhero Fun Fun. Again, it showed people were hopping on this bandwagon just to make money. But still, no one knew why it was turning dark. Other than the idea that the nursery rhyme videos, due to the sheer quantity and nonsensical nature of them, were being pumped out by some algorithm, there wasn't really an explanation for why the videos were turning out as bizarre as they were. Just because of how grotesque and morally appalling the content was, a lot of people tended towards the conspiracy angle. All of this might be an attempt by predators to familiarize children with duality and thereby making them comfortable with it, so that if an adult preys on them, they're more likely to go along with it. And while we'll circle around to this thought much later in the video, it just seems like way too decentralized of a thing for all the creators of this content to be pedophiles. The kids seeing the videos the world over are not even the ones they can prey on, unless this was some kind of long-term 4D chess ploy by a huge Illuminati-esque organization looking to normalize pedophilia in the long run. Which, in this case, I just don't see it. So, is this all just clickbaiting children with horrifying things to exploit their morbid curiosity for money? Really? That's, that's it? Well, yes, probably. If I was an individual or company with a strong knowledge of YouTube and ways to game it, how can I make the most money? Maybe I'm just smart, maybe I've developed a flawless keyword generator, maybe I've hired a large chunk of market researchers, maybe it's Maybelline. Either way, I have a surefire way to make money off YouTube and I want to expand my market. I either A. Sell the information to studios and content creators, B. Sign on creators to be a part of my network, they get guaranteed clicks, I get a share of the profits, C. Create a tool that generates animations based on keywords, outsource the creative tasks to small animation and graphic design studios. Personally, I think this whole Elsagate thing is a combination of A, B, and C with different studios and curators involved. Why are the videos so screwed up? Most of the videos fall under the category of things kids often find mysterious, scary, or taboo. Which, if you look at more adult forms of mysterious, scary, or taboo content, you'll recognize that those things are exactly what people look for in clickbait content. In this case, it's wrapped up in a package catered towards children. Feces, urine, spiders, needles, sex, all all things that are normally considered bad when you're a kid. This feeling of watching something that you're not supposed to watch is probably quite stimulating for kids, so they keep watching and the creators keep creating. It's more interesting than what's on TV because it's different, even if the kid doesn't know why it's different. Why kids videos? Children are easy targets for manipulation and they're a cash cow for YouTube creators. They don't skip ads, which brings the creator a lot more revenue than skipping, they don't get bored of repetitive concepts, they can be easily hooked on almost any concept, and they just let YouTube play on auto 
auto play continuously. This is the ideal situation for anyone with a strong knowledge of keywords and without a conscience. What's with the gibberish in the comments? Content on YouTube won't get recommendations unless it has high engagement on top of views and watch time. This is how YouTube detects whether or not a video's views are legitimate as opposed to acquired by bots. The kids bring in the views, but unfortunately they don't comment much. These gibberish comments are either bots or click farms designed to trick YouTube into thinking that this video is popular, engaging, and legitimate. Therefore, it should be recommended to viewers that are interested in the video like the one they just watched. Among the various theories, the least conspiratorial one suggested that individuals from second and third world countries without moral reservations were using taboo subjects as clickbait to generate easy money by luring children's curiosity. Although the content can be extremely repulsive, it has a captivating effect on young children, much like witnessing a fire or a car crash to an adult. Think back to when you yourself were a young child on the internet. There were probably instances where you clicked on scary or off-putting links, or videos you knew were inappropriate out of sheer curiosity. Despite being the least sinister theory, it still carries a deeply unsettling and dark nature. The people responsible for the worst Elsagate content are either seriously depraved individuals, or people who are desperate for money and just looking to make it any way they can. The other alternative is that some of the creators themselves have the fetishes they feature in their videos, so not only do they not mind making the videos, they actively enjoy and relish in putting this content out to kids. The last part certainly seems like it might be part of it in certain cases, but why else escalate from simple sexualized content, which would definitely be enough to clickbait curious kids, into super weird and obscure fetishes. As the Elsa Gate scandal escalated and horrible videos kept coming down the pipe, it was inevitable that sooner or later it would turn into a big enough controversy for something to be done by YouTube themselves. Summer 2017 saw YouTube changing their monetization policies, including forbidding channels that depicted kids' characters in inappropriate situations from being monetized. Presumably, the reason people were doing this was for money, so if you removed that incentive, it would put an end to the issue. But, come to find out, in fall 2017, while this policy did exist, it wasn't being enforced very well. All it showed was that YouTube was well aware of this problem, they just weren't dispatching the appropriate resources to get it handled, which made it look much worse for them. But, before I go any further, a word from today's sponsor. Finding reliable sources for news can be hard. There's a lot of misinformation out there and a lot of political bias. If you want to make reading the news easier, become a smarter consumer of information, and make informed decisions with that knowledge, that's where Ground News comes comes in. With their app and website, you can get a visual breakdown of the news outlets covering every story. You can see their political bias, how factual the source is, who owns that source, and which countries are covering the story. You can even compare headlines from foreign sources to see how language differences shape our understanding of breaking news. Their blind spot coverage page shows articles that are underreported or overreported by sources to help examine political bias. You can even follow specific topics like artificial intelligence and cryptocurrency to stay up to date and never miss a new development. Go to ground.news slash turkeytom to stay fully informed. You can sign up for free or subscribe through my link before July 1st for 30% off unlimited access if you support their mission. And once again, a big thanks to Ground News for sponsoring today's video but the bad publicity was just getting started. On November 4th, the New York Times published an article that would start a domino effect, culminating in a huge outcry during the holiday season. They had gotten in touch with some parents whose small children had encountered these videos on YouTube Kids and naturally were mortified. It was a typical night in Stacey Burns' house outside Fort Wayne, Indiana. She was cooking dinner while her three-year-old son, Isaac, watched videos on the YouTube Kids app on an iPad. Suddenly, he cried out, Mommy, the monster scares me! When Miss Burns walked over, Isaac was watching a video featuring crude renderings of the characters from Paw Patrol, a Nickelodeon show that is popular among preschoolers, screaming in a car. The vehicle hurtled into a light pole and burst into flames. In the 10-minute clip, Paw Patrol babies pretend to die, parentheses, died by Annabelle hypnotized, some characters died, and one walked off a roof after being hypnotized by a likeness of a doll possessed by a demon. Being the New York Times, they had the resources to actually get in touch with YouTube about this, and their response was nothing short of laughable. Malik Ducard, YouTube's global head of family and learning content, said that the inappropriate videos were the extreme needle in the haystack, but that making the app family friendly is of the utmost importance to us. The extreme needle in the haystack is a funny way of describing channels that were in the 
top 10 on YouTube in monthly views. It's a funny way to describe hundreds of videos with tens of millions, sometimes hundreds of millions of views. The Times was also able to gather some interesting details about how the production of these videos worked. One intriguing detail was that a large proportion of channels operated in networks, a point we'll tackle in a little bit. The journalist also got some interesting responses from the owner of one of these channels. The account that posted the video seen by Miss Burns' son is named Super Aries TV. Questions sent there were mostly ignored, though the account did reply, That's a cute character, and video is a funny story. Take it easy, that's it. A Super Zeus TV account included a link to a shopping site called SuperKidsShop.com, which is registered in Ho Chi Minh City, Vietnam. A call to the phone number listed in that site's registration records was answered by a man who declined to identify himself. He said that his partners were responsible for the videos, and that a team of about 100 people worked on them. He said he would forward email requests for comment to them. Those emails went unanswered. Other mothers complained that, seeing as YouTube Kids is a children's platform, there should be people whose sole job it is to clean this stuff up, and enough of those employees for moderation to be done competently. If you build an application specifically for children's entertainment, where you're brazen enough to allow anyone to upload anything, you should be able to ensure to a reasonable degree that the content on it will be suitable for children, or at least not completely unsuitable. It brings up the point that YouTube shouldn't have gotten into this business and marketed their platform to parents of toddlers if they didn't have the resources to moderate it appropriately. As November progressed, more and more influential people started talking about Elsagate. We would see YouTubers like Mudahar from Some Ordinary Gamers and Philip DeFranco cover it. Where, uh, as you can see, the, the officer is about to shoot the fucking baby Elsa with a with a Glock. God, God bless today's fucking world, ladies and gentlemen. Holy shit. Baby gets sick. Daddy crying for his... I don't think Daddy's gonna cry. I think Daddy's about to beat the shit out of these two for breaking the iPad, or at least that's the vibe I'm getting from the studio. This is from Zin Zin Cartoon, titled Minions Banana Baby Drinks Piss Water. Funny story, full episodes. Finger Family Song Nursery. Also, you'll notice a lot of the titles, the descriptions, the tags. It's kind of like this word soup. Once again, that's people taking advantage of the algorithm by using highly searched terms in their description. And there's a full disgusting rainbow of obscene and really inappropriate video. There's a lot of tricking people into drinking pee eating poop. You get stuff like Princess Rapunzel and Spider-Man Buried Alive, Venom Poop, and you see a, what looks to be a bloodied Rapunzel with poop on her head. Dan Olson of Folding Ideas released a particularly insightful video at the time, explaining the probable origin of the animation and CG segment of the market. Studios in India that used to pump out cheap nursery rhyme DVDs in the 90s, who had now made the jump to the internet, using their same industrial process with new characters and edgier themes, the latter of which somehow got folded in along the way. Olson also pointed out that some of these channels were part of a larger conglomerate, and that, along with stuffing every keyword imaginable into their titles, they were exploiting the algorithm by pushing the same videos out on dozens of different channels, giving the illusion of content diversity. There are 58 channels attached to that MCN, almost all of them posting nearly identical content based off the same source library. Everything about it screams minimal human interaction. The strategy here is to cast a very wide net with the illusion of diversity. A a single channel uploading dozens of videos per day will quickly trip YouTube's spam alarms, but a network of dozens of channels uploading one video each per day won't. YouTube's search algorithms and recommended videos try to give you content that's just like whatever you just watched, but they're also designed to force a bit of variety to prevent a single channel from totally dominating a given genre. The distributed spam technique works around this, meaning the algorithm can deliver diverse results from many different channels channels while actually delivering results that all point back to the same core entity. But that's not actually even the end of the story. You might notice that I've stripped the audio entirely from all the examples that I've used here, and there's a good reason for that. So here's an interesting experiment that I've already done for you. Re-upload a bunch of these videos and watch the copyright claims come rolling in. I uploaded five videos to a burner channel and within half an hour had 32 copyright claims, all of which had the attached policy of a global Lock. One video in particular got hit with 13 separate claims. Tabloid, a French-Canadian media organization, published a video concerning Toy Monster, another channel along the lines of Webs and Tiaras. The creators of the videos, located in the southern region of Quebec City, were approached by Tabloid for an interview but declined. However, an actor from the channel's cast came forward anonymously and mentioned that contractual obligations prevented him from providing any comments. Much like with the animations, the investigation uncovered that many channels were all seemingly 
seemingly managed by the same individuals and were posting identical content. Even celebrities would chip into the discussion, such as Bob of all people from, you know, the, the Haley Williams song, meme or whatever with Mordecai. You know what I'm talking about, okay? As well as Joe Rogan. And like this, this scene keeps happening over and over again where they have beer, they get fucked up, and then as the baby falls, the beer bottle bounces off his head and shatters and lands on the ground and the baby's bleeding. It happens over and over again. And so in this one with the minions, the little baby minions, they fall, bam, gets cut in the head. It's the same scene. Here's the Mickey Mouse one. Little babies get fucked up, they fall, beer bottle hits the baby in the head. There's another one with little foxes. They get fucked up, beer bottle hits the kid in the head. It's always the same shit. A large contributor to the growing public awareness was a Medium article written by James Bridle. Bridle's article provides a comprehensive review of the various types of Elsagate content, illustrating how they deteriorate from slightly peculiar yet harmless videos like surprise egg unboxings and automated keyword spam nursery rhymes to the more disturbing examples we went over before. Additionally, Bridle draws attention to a channel with over 8 million subscribers called Toy Freaks, a channel like many others where parents use their children for content. However, what sets Toy Freaks Apart was the type of behavior that the father, Greg Chisholm, was enacting on his daughters. In Bridal's words, as well as nursery rhymes and learning colors, Toy Freak specializes in gross-out situations, as well as activities which many, many viewers feel border on abuse and exploitation, if not cross the line entirely, including videos of the children vomiting and in pain. In other videos, the girls were made to act like babies when they were much older, dressed with pigtails and pacifiers in their mouths, with the videos being tagged with terms like like Bad Baby, which had appeared in other Elsagate content. There were even examples of Chisholm throwing objects at his daughters. This showed that unfortunately, Elsagate and YouTube's failure to moderate their platform wasn't just about content for children, but of children, which brings me to another problem. To make matters worse for YouTube, it was at this exact same time that outlets such as The Times started publishing videos about the massive amount of inappropriate videos of underage girls on their website. In essence, a lot of naive children had uploaded clips of themselves in bathing suits or doing gymnastics, and these videos were attracting predators to their comment sections who left all kinds of disgusting remarks. The problem was particularly bad, yet again on account of the algorithm. Once you clicked on one of these videos of a young girl, 20 more would pop up on the sidebar, because that's what other viewers of the same video had watched and were interested in, since, well, they were pedophiles. These videos had tens of thousands, sometimes hundreds of thousands or millions of views, and tons of perverted comments. Predators would even compile them in playlists to build a stash of sorts. Even worse, there were ads playing on these videos, meaning YouTube was unintentionally profiting off of hosting softcore child exploitation content for predators to enjoy. This catastrophic situation was on the verge of triggering another adpocalypse for YouTube, following the one that had occurred earlier that same year. The combination of the Elsagate videos and this new scandal prompted major companies like Mars, Adidas, Deutsche Bank, and others to withdraw their advertisements from the platform. No reputable brand and wanted to be associated with, well, any of this. This posed a significant problem for YouTube, seeing as it was the holiday season, which is when ad rates are typically the highest, making it the most lucrative quarter of the year. Public outcry was at an all-time high, YouTube's reputation was suffering, and their bottom line was about to take a massive hit. Apparently, only the last item was a big enough problem to prompt a response, because advertisers withdrawing is what triggered YouTube to finally clean up their site, or at least attempts to. Prior to any significant crackdown, YouTube had announced that they would implement an obvious, yet necessary step, which was to age restrict the Elsagate videos that were being flagged, rather than simply demonetize them. However, that was just the first change. According to a book on YouTube's history titled Like, Comment, Subscribe, while YouTube's executives were in talks to devise a solution, one proposal entailed simply turning off all brand ads for the time being, the ads that played before, during, and after videos. The book also details the sheer scale of Elsagate when it was at its peak, showing the magnitude of the problem YouTube had on their hands. An internal report drawn up for Disney before YouTube's decision estimated that the entertainment giant's promotional clips drew in a billion views per month. Unauthorized amateur videos featuring Elsa were raking in 13 billion views per month. What it would require to truly eliminate the issue at hand were large swaths of channel terminations and video demonetizations, which is precisely what happened. At the end of November, YouTube reportedly told BuzzFeed News that they'd already taken down 250 channels and 150,000 videos. They turned off 
off the comment section on 600,000 more videos to deter predators. Recognizing the need for increased manpower, the company also announced they would add 10,000 people to their review team to watch and flag videos. Even Toy Freaks had their channel terminated, and Greg Chisholm was being investigated by child protection officials in Illinois and Missouri, though they wouldn't end up pressing any criminal charges. While that all sounds well and good, fixing the problem of inappropriate kids' content being on YouTube wouldn't be that simple. Articles and videos were still coming out shortly after the terms of service enforcements, saying these videos were still readily accessible on the platform. Maybe it would take just a bit more time for everything to get sorted out, you know? Perhaps. Well, let's fast forward to 2019. Surely by then it would be evident whether YouTube's approach was effective. You know, I knew I was going to make a comeback video, but I didn't know it was going to be this, and I didn't know that this might possibly be the last video that I ever make on this platform because I don't want to support it anymore because of what I'm about to talk about. Over the past 48 hours, I have discovered a wormhole, as I would call it, into a softcore pedophile ring on YouTube. Here, pedophiles are trading social media contacts. They're providing links to actual child in YouTube comments. They're trading unlisted videos in secret. And YouTube's algorithm, through some kind of glitch or error in its programming, is actually facilitating their ability to do this. The problem that was arguably the worst part of the original scandal had either come back with a vengeance or had never left. According to Wired.com, videos of children showing their exposed box, underwear, and gender are racking up millions of views on YouTube, with the site displaying advertising from major cosmetics and car brands alongside the content. Comments beneath scores of videos appear to show pedophiles sharing timestamps for parts of the videos where exposed genitals can be seen, or when a child does the splits or lifts up their top. Some of the children in the videos, most of whom are girls, appear to be as young as five. Many of the videos have hundreds of thousands, if not millions of views, with hundreds of comments. Even search suggestions help funnel people down that path. Start typing girl yoga and the autocomplete options include young and hot. Enter twister girl and autocomplete suggests little girl twister and skirt. The Verge also covered the situation, drawing attention to the fact that this has been a problem on YouTube since 2013 and still no satisfactory solution had been found. While YouTube claims that most of these videos now have comments turned off, that doesn't seem to be true in practice. Most of the videos The Verge came across had comments enabled, with 450 hours of content uploaded every minute and billions of users logging in every month, some videos are bound to slip through. Naturally, advertisers pulled out again. In response, YouTube swiftly made the decision to ban comments on videos of children altogether, which many said should have been done the first time this was discovered, but nonetheless it was a step in the right direction. They also prevented kids' videos from being added to playlists to prevent predators from compiling them. However, a few months later, comments aside, the problem of the videos themselves gaining traction on the platform hadn't been resolved. Those didn't need to use playlists because the algorithm served them the videos they were looking for on a silver platter. The New York Times reported, Kristen C. didn't think anything of it when her 10-year-old daughter and a friend uploaded a video of themselves playing in a backyard pool. A few days later, her daughter shared exciting news. The video had hundreds of thousands of views. Before long, it had ticked up to 400,000, a staggering number for a video of a child in a two-piece bathing suit with her friend. YouTube's automated recommendation system had begun showing the video to users who watched other videos of prepubescent partially clothed children. They also got in touch with researchers who found out that it wasn't just YouTube's algorithm recommending more videos of children to those who were already on one, but leading people in that direction from videos of adults. When they followed recommendations on sexually themed videos, they noticed something that they say disturbed them. In many cases, the videos became more bizarre or extreme and placed greater emphasis on youth. Videos of women discussing sex, for example, sometimes led to videos of women in underwear or breastfeeding, sometimes mentioning their age. 19, 18, even 16. After a few clicks, some played more overtly at prepubescence, posing in children's clothing. From there, YouTube would suddenly begin recommending videos of young and partially clothed kids. From there, YouTube would suddenly begin recommending videos of children. Then, a near-endless stream of them drawn primarily from Latin America and Eastern Europe. Of course, when they got in touch with YouTube about this, they gave their usual response. Jennifer O'Connor, YouTube's product director for Trust and Safety, said the company was committed to eradicating the exploitation of children on its platform and had worked non-stop since February on improving enforcement. Protecting kids is at the top of our list, she said. Is that so? Because just a few months later, YouTube would find themselves in trouble with the FTC. Perhaps the government was tipped off by Elsa Gate and all the child 
child safety concerns surrounding YouTube in the previous years, but whatever the reason, they started digging into the company more than ever before, discovering that, allegedly, they had a blatant disregard for children's privacy laws. The press release on the FTC's website reads, Google will pay a record $170 million to settle allegations by the Federal Trade Commission that the YouTube video sharing service illegally collected personal information from children without their parents' consent, allegedly violating the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act, or COPPA, rule. According to the complaint, YouTube violated the COPPA rule by collecting personal information in the form of persistent identifiers that are used to track users across the internet, from the viewers of children-directed channels, without first notifying parents and getting their consent. YouTube earned millions of dollars by using the identifiers, commonly known as cookies, to deliver targeted ads to viewers of these channels. YouTube touted its popularity with children to prospective corporate clients, said FTC Chairman Joe Simons. Yet, when it came to complying with COPPA, the company refused to acknowledge that portions of its platform were clearly directed to kids. There is no excuse for YouTube's violations of the law. With the need to imminently comply, and with COPPA looming over them, YouTube took swift action. However, the enforcement of their policy changes relied heavily on the automated systems, leading to unintended consequences, and non-kids channels were caught in the crossfire. And while that may be all for 2019, it's not nearly the end of the story. What happened to all the bizarre kids content, the central focus of this video? Well, luckily in the year 2023, Spider-Man and Elsa videos really are no more. But that's only because other characters have taken their place. Elsa Gate is back just in a different format. Videos featuring heavy emphasis on feet, farting, feces, and just general, like, outwardly sexual themes, like Minecraft characters, the girls having massive circles on their chests, or there being some videos featuring animals. We still have our very fair share of disturbing stop motions and disturbing animations that are bloody and weird. There's also a channel who features, get this, Friday Night Funkin' mods of Sonic characters, but they're getting Friday Night F***ed in them. I'm not joking. They feature Friday Night Funkin' mods. They're being hit from the back, and it's not even a joke. This is just, this is just on YouTube. They okay, so she's drinking the Coke. Her stomach is aching. All right, she's she's walking towards the subscribe button, squatting over. Okay, very, very um suggestively, might I add. What would she do to that old subscribe button, okay? What do you think's gonna happen? How, how are they gonna get you to subscribe? Well, ladies and gentlemen, they're gonna piss on it! <laughs> the quick rundown is that there's still disturbing children's content on YouTube, encompassing the same exact tropes as before, albeit now thriving under different franchises. The crucial distinction is that it's no longer prevalent on YouTube Kids itself. I've checked, and although it is still possible to occasionally encounter inappropriate videos on the platform, it poses a legitimate challenge. Currently, Elsagate videos are more commonly found on regular YouTube, but due to the nature of the content and the low engagement in terms of comments and likes, it's likely that they're still reaching their target demographic of young kids. After all, who else would watch this garbage? Alternatively, the low engagement could be attributed to creators viewbotting. In either case, it's a serious problem as the new wave of Elsagate videos are amassing millions and sometimes tens of millions of views. These channels are monetized, and if you click on their videos, you'll see ads. They're making money off of this, which, I mean, is the most obvious motivation for anyone to subject themselves to producing this unexplainable slop. I cannot imagine someone doing this for free. However, the channels frequently get abandoned. You'll often come across ones that uploaded for years straight and then stopped uploading altogether a few months or even weeks ago. This is likely because YouTube demonetizes them, and the creators then make new channels, suddenly dump a bunch of content on them, make money for as long as the channel is monetized, and then when YouTube realizes what they're up to and stops paying them, they move on to a new one. Because these videos typically don't have narration or audio, there's almost no way for AI to pick up on the inappropriate themes, so there's most likely a window for them to get away with the content and profit from it before a human picks up on what's going on, and then they have to switch to a new channel. As for who these channels are and what they're actually posting, well, you've been warned. We're about to get into some seriously disgusting and depraved territory. On the milder end of the spectrum, there's a channel called Hulu Wulu Animations. It boasts over 1 million subscribers and a staggering 600 million channel views. While it may not exhibit the most obvious red flags, one striking aspect is its peculiar fascination with violence.
It seems excessive considering the content is primarily intended for kids. At least, that's who seems to be watching the videos based on the minimal amount of engagement they receive. Take, for example, this video with over 1.5 million views, but only 100 comments. This, of course, debunks the disclaimer often used by these channels at the beginning of their videos or in their about sections nowadays, claiming that the content isn't intended for kids, thinking that it will protect them from repercussions from YouTube. Another similar channel worth mentioning is Anima Meme, which focuses on 3D animations. Once again, there's this odd fixation on violence. The thumbnails depict characters from Poppy's Playtime going through grinders in a graphic way, although the actual videos only show them sliding through the grinder without the explicit gore. There's also a very prevalent toilet theme, particularly someone sticking their head out of a toilet. These videos have amassed millions of views as well, and they all revolve around the same concept. Anima Meme even goes as far as creating Watch Mojo style rankings of their own live leak style animations, such as Mommy Long Legs Top 5 Grinder Deaths. Another Poppy Playtime channel is Kissy Show, which makes live action videos, which we saw before in the clip from some ordinary gamers. Among Us is another IP that got huge in recent years, so I wonder what these freaks have done with that game. Take this channel called uh, Mimi, for example, with 22,000 subscribers and 1.6 million channel views in total. Let's look at their most popular video. Kissy Missy plus Huggy Wuggy's Paints equals question mark Poppy's Playtime Animation. Uh, then we have Among Us and Rainbow Friends Animation with, I'm not really sure what this character is, but their, you know, their ass is obviously right there. And here we have what looks like uh, the the imposters or whatever, the, the, the crewmates from Among Us, very eagerly awaiting this other character about to stick a syringe into their backside, I assume. Then if we go here, we have Huggy Wuggy and Mommy Long Legs, Glamrock Chica equals Five Nights at Freddy's, whatever. Huggy Wuggy and Kissy Missy, Mommy Long Legs equals question mark Five Nights at Freddy's animation. And uh, there we have, I think, Poppy's playtime characters, once again with the syringe being inserted as, as, as a kind of probe. Very disturbing, very disturbing stuff. Then we have Orange, which uh, if we go to their channel, we can see they have 100,000 subscribers. Go to the About tab, they have 36 million total views. Go to Popular, and it's all like Among Us characters with their asses out, with their butts out. I don't know what the deal is here. I don't I don't know why exactly. That's that's their most common theme. I guess kids really click on them, but clearly uh, Orange is hitting it big with the uh, Among Us caked up content. Then we have Pop Among, which is a channel with 26,000 subscribers. We've got 12 million total channel views. We go to their most popular videos, and uh, once again, we've got just, you know, an ass in every thumbnail. Unfortunately, a significant portion of it has gone into a hyper sexualized direction, featuring some of the best, and by that I mean worst, thumbnails in the game. Many of them revolve around suggestive depictions of butt cracks and characters sliding admin cards through them. Um, yeah, you heard that right. The male character often has a mischievous expression, which I guess is fitting, but really, come on guys. And it's not clickbait, the videos actually show what's being depicted in the thumbnails, although typically censored or obstructed by another image. Nonetheless, you can still discern what's happening. Hmm. And um, no, I did not add the oh no 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 audio in post. That's the that's the original video. Not kidding. The channel specializing in this specific type of content fortunately have smaller followings. However, certain videos within their catalogs have still reached millions of views. If we return to the channel Mimi, which also incorporates characters from Poppy Playtime and Five Nights at Freddy's, in their thumbnails you'll find various scenarios reminiscent of Elsa Gate, suggestive situations, syringes being inserted, farting, all the hood classics. However, there seems to be a new trend emerging of characters getting stuck in fences and washing machines in compromising positions. This is a trope that's specific to adult content, so to see it show up in videos for kids in elementary and preschool is nothing short of extremely disturbing. That brings me to Minecraft animations, which are still flourishing to this day, but not in the same way you'd want. Check out Steve You Gotta Help Me I'm Stuck, with 12 million views and only 500 comments, by OMG Cartoons. There are hundreds if not thousands of videos about the I'm Stuck trope. Another popular trope is biting twins, a supposedly funny gag where a girl bites a boy on the chest, they both laugh, and then the boy reciprocates, leading to a different reaction from the girl. Mr. Craft, for example, is a channel with millions of views that was exclusively dedicated to pumping out these videos with extremely inappropriate thumbnails that unfortunately, again, are not clickbait. I obviously can't show the content, but yeah, if you click on one of these videos, what you see in the thumbnail is exactly what you get in the video. If you look up Minecraft Love Story, you'll get a ton of similar stories 
stuff. Some channels, like XD James, have mostly innocuous videos where only the thumbnails were kind of pushing it. But then there's channels like Mark Craft, X Studio, and Hick Hick, where there's pregnant characters, characters giving birth, implied rape scenes, twerking, bondage, wait look, it's Spider-Man, and whatever the hell this is, all taking place in Minecraft. Used as shears to remove a girl's clothes in Minecraft. Trolling girls? I'm definitely seeing the lingering influence of prank YouTube in these videos to this day, what with sex crimes qualifying as trolling. Heck, you can find Minecraft student teacher gay porn if you look hard enough. Futuristic hub walked so that these guys could run. There's even giantess videos in Minecraft. Honestly, the DeviantArt representation here is off the charts. And I gotta shout out NinjaCraft for their thumbnails. First of all, I got two ads when I clicked on a video of theirs, and one of them was a 15 second unskippable one, so I think advertisers agree with me on the quality of this content, being extremely high. Second of all, the guy in some basement in Russia who cooks these up is truly pouring his blood, sweat, and tears into them. I mean, what inside a portal? Isn't that just the question? of the century, I simply must click. I have to find out what's inside Portal. Meanwhile, with animations, there's more content in the vein of your classic Elsagate videos, with characters defecating on each other, strip clubs, syringes, panty shots, people on toilets, even characters tied up and about to be R-worded. Like, what's going on here? Some of this stuff is significantly worse than what was ever present in OG Elsagate content. A lot of the thumbnails are just cropped from real Rule 34. This brings me to Gotcha Life, which got big in 2019 and continued being posted on the platform to this day, being their absolutely abominable selves. Gotcha Life sets itself apart by having a particular fixation on gay twincest, student-teacher relationships, and even parent-child relationships. Just the, the most twisted and depraved stuff happening in, in the Gotcha Life community right now. People have been well aware of this issue, and there's even a subreddit dedicated to Gotcha Life cringe, but the degeneracy persists. To give you an idea of how bad it is, there is actual Gotcha Life tentacle hentai on YouTube.com, and it came up as one of the first search results when I looked up Gotcha Life. Or you've got channels like Rainbow Z Multiverse with over 700k subscribers, and Clapsnap with almost 200k, where it's all about pregnancy stuff, piss and poop denial, and just... Why does everything have to be about the bathroom, and people farting, and, and everything? It's driving me fucking insane. Speaking of which, there's a genre of live action animation videos by a guy called Kluna Tick that are the most insanely disgusting Elsagate videos by far. I legitimately gag looking at the thumbnails, but the videos themselves somehow managed to be so much worse. I actually reacted to them on my second channel, and I think I permanently altered my brain chemistry in the process. One objectionable tidbit I was able to find on YouTube Kids was, again, a scatological piece of content with an astonishing 31 million views from Hello Jadu T. TV called Have a Nice Bowel. You've got an animation of a little girl going to the bathroom with sound effects and everything, and it's just repulsive. Needless to say, this isn't something you would ever see on traditional TV. Now, I know this has been quite an extensive review, but allow me to close off with just one more. Roblox, which as you probably know, had an explosion in popularity since the original Elsagate scandal in 2017. If you thought Roblox itself was bad, the content about Roblox on YouTube brings its atrocities to a much wider audience. Behold, Roblox far roleplay. 3.2 million views. But the crowning achievement of the YouTube Roblox community has to be kidnapping a kid, then farting on it. Yes, it's a female character sitting on top of a baby character, and I mean, you know, what happens. Now, even though the creators of this content may not be predators themselves, getting kids to be more comfortable with weird kinks may be one of its inadvertent effects. Though, this is based on anecdotal notes from the internet, so not the most reliable source. A post on the Elsagate subreddit asks, did Elsa Gate actually have any permanent effects on the kids who watched it? I don't personally know anyone because I was out of the target demographic when it came out, but I've read other ask.fm posts where people have said it got them into pits. I've heard a lot of people claim that they watched Elsagate videos during their most popular years and have now either become hypersexual, desensitized to gore, or even have certain fetishes that were shown in the videos. Pregnancy, needles, etc. I mean, I watched a bit as a kid and now I have a weird kink and gore doesn't freak me out, but I'm fine. I have watched Elsa Gate and other disgusting stuff before, so it affected me very badly. I think it had harmful effects on me permanently. I found out these things got serious for me, so I got away from Elsa Gate and went to watch other peaceful things that aren't harmful or disgusting. It was not Elsa Gate per se, but similar weird kids videos that I can confidently say did something to me. I sometimes fear this type of content made me have a weird obsession with one of the fetishes you mentioned. Not gonna say which though. I've become very obsessed with the topic, so much so I think it's become my most searched word on my iPad, but I'm not sure. 
Putting all the perversion aside for a minute, even when children's content on YouTube is actually age appropriate, it's still mostly brain rotting garbage without a semblance of educational value. There's no moral to the story, no rhyme or reason for what's happening. Any kid who's beyond a Coco Melon learning colors level of intellect has nothing of value left to glean from the original content made for them on this site. And that's somewhat of a tragedy unto itself. In 2020, a study was conducted by Common Sense Media in conjunction with C.S. Mott Children's Hospital, attempting to survey what kind of content exactly YouTube Kids was composed of. Consumerism was a major component of half of all the videos, whereas only 25% featured any kind of educational value. Studies have also shown that toddler screen time correlates with their likelihood of exhibiting symptoms of ADHD, and it isn't hard to imagine why that would be the case if you've ever watched YouTube Shorts intended for kids. YouTube's moderation definitely needs some working on, from improved algorithms to better policies and increased staff. I just don't see how blatantly inappropriate content, with tens of millions of views, which most certainly has been reported by an adult at some point, doesn't get taken down. At the same time, we have to recognize these videos will always crop up on the site to some degree. Fundamentally, the only way to assure a child will never stumble into this content unsupervised is for their parents to be vigilant. Unfortunately, all too many parents are careless with giving their children technology. If YouTube can't keep these videos off their site and parents can't be bothered to keep an eye on what their kids are watching, then they honestly shouldn't be giving their children a tablet with YouTube, and would be better off sticking to, I don't know, TV? Or hey, ever heard about going outside? I've been Turkey Tom, thanks for watching, and until next time... Actually, there may not be a next time. It's becoming clear to me that I've chosen the wrong career path on YouTube, and frankly, I'd make far more AdSense if I was in the family-friendly YouTube niche instead of the video essay, whatever this is. So, I will be imminently rebranding to Turkey Toddlers. Get ready to see me breaking the Geneva Conventions while dressed up as Huggy Wuggy, with Kevin McLeod tracks playing in the background. I hear that's all the rage these days. Okay, but seriously, thanks for watching, and until next time, leave me alone.